I call on the representative of Pakistan. Mr. President, I take the floor to exercise our right of reply to the statement in the general debate earlier today in which the Foreign Minister of India indulged in an orgy of slander against my country. Her comments towards Pakistan betray the hostility that the Indian leadership has towards Pakistan, hostility that we have endured for 70 long years. Repeating falsehoods year after year does not and cannot conceal or alter the truth. But in her vitriol, India's foreign minister deliberately ignored the core issue of Jammu and Kashmir. So let me be clear, Jammu and Kashmir is not a part of India. It is recognized by the United Nations and the international community as disputed territory. I invite all of you and the Indian foreign minister to look at the UN maps. Thus, India's military occupation of the state is illegal. The UN Security Council has, in over a dozen resolutions, decided that the dispute must be resolved by enabling the people of Jammu and Kashmir to determine their own destiny through a UN-supervised plebiscite. India accepted these UN resolutions, but it has avoided implementing them through obfuscation, diversion, deceit, and aggression. India's brutal occupation of Kashmir has killed over 100,000 innocent Kashmiri children, women, and men. Today, that campaign of brutality continues, including the shooting and blinding of innocent Kashmiri children with pellet guns. Yet every day, these Kashmiri children, women, and youth come out on the streets to demand that India get out of occupied Kashmir. India cannot hide behind semantics. Any interstate dispute like Kashmir is by definition an international dispute. If the parties fail to resolve a dispute, the UN and the international community has not only the right, but the obligation to intervene and help to resolve the dispute. In the case of Jammu and Kashmir, that obligation is explicit since the Security Council has been involved with this dispute since its very inception and because the Council has prescribed very specifically and precisely how the dispute should be resolved. UN Security Council resolutions do not lapse with time, nor are they overtaken, as the Indian Foreign Minister put it. Law, Mr. President, has no expiry date. Morality has no sell-by date. India's posture is that of the predator. It cannot escape its legal and moral obligation to abide by the resolutions of the Security Council. Any other interpretation will open the door to the logic of force in international relations. India, Mr. President, now also refuses a bilateral dialogue with Pakistan, either composite or comprehensive. The conditions it poses that first there be an end to violence begs the question. Violence emanates first and foremost from India's occupation and brutal suppression of the people of Kashmir. Under the circumstances, my Prime Minister has proposed that the Secretary General should appoint a special representative or a special envoy, as several of his predecessors did, to promote the implementation of the relevant provisions of the Security Council resolutions. At the same time, the United Nations should also take steps to investigate India's ongoing and massive violations of human rights in Kashmir, end the impunity enjoyed by India's security forces, lift the draconian emergency laws, and punish those responsible for the war crimes and for the genocide in Kashmir. Mr. President, if the international community wishes to avoid a dangerous escalation between India and Pakistan, it must call on India to halt its provocations and its aggressive actions. It must end the ceasefire violations along the LOC. It must halt its sponsorship of terrorist groups inside Pakistan. Mr. President, India's foreign minister has spoken much about terrorism. The UN should actually define terrorism. And in that definition, we should include state terrorism. The state terrorism which the Indian National Security Advisor has boasted is being sponsored by India's spy agencies in my country.
in what he called a double squeeze strategy. Pakistan has in its custody an Indian spy, an intelligence officer, Kulbushin Yadev, who confessed to India's support to terrorist activities in my country. In fact, India has considerable experience in the state sponsorship of terrorism in our region. It has sponsored and perpetrated terrorism and aggression against all its neighbors, creating terrorist groups, destabilizing and blockading neighbors to do its strategic bidding, and sponsoring subversion, sabotage, and terrorism in various parts of Pakistan. All this establishes that India is the mother of terrorism in South Asia. Mr. President, India's proclivity to violence is also no secret. In the 70 years since its independence, India has been engaged in at least over a dozen instances of the use of force and continues to face 17 insurgencies in its own land. It has fought a war with or in each of its neighbors. Mr. President, the Indian Foreign Minister sought to denigrate my country's founding father, Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. All I can say about India's current political luminaries is that they belong to a political organization that has the blood of thousands of Muslims of Gujarat on their hands. Today, this so-called democracy is the world's largest hypocrisy. This, Mr. President, is the face of India's democracy. India is ruled by a government in which a racist and fascist ideology is firmly embedded. The leadership of this government emanates from the RSS, the same extremist group which is accused of assassinating Mahatma Gandhi. It is a government which has appointed a fanatic as the chief minister of India's largest state, whose rallying cry to his mobs was, if one Hindu is killed, we will kill a hundred Muslims. It is a government which has allowed the lynching of Muslims. And all this is amply documented by international human rights organizations. Indeed, as one of India's most famous contemporary authors recently said, and I quote, these horrific murders are only a symptom. Life is hell for the living too. Whole populations of Dalits, Adivas, Muslims and Christians are being forced to live in terror, unsure of when and from where the next assault would come." Unquote. And then again, quote, much of what is in the air in India now is pure terror in Kashmir in other places. Unquote. Mr. President, the Indian Foreign Minister spoke about human rights. So let me ask, who is using pellet guns that are blinding unarmed protesters, including children, infants in occupied Kashmir? Who is violating the fundamental rights, not only of the brave people of Kashmir, but hundreds of millions of Indians? And who is using rape as an instrument of terror, as an instrument of state policy to crush a popular and indigenous movement in the occupied state of Jammu and Kashmir? In conclusion, Mr. President, let me say, Pakistan remains open to resuming a comprehensive dialogue with India to address all outstanding issues, especially Jammu and Kashmir, and to discuss measures to maintain peace and security. But this dialogue must be accompanied by an end to India's campaign of subversion and state-sponsored terrorism in Pakistan. I thank you.